So this is a continuation of some selected practice test number two problems. I'm going to start with number 25, which is at the bottom of this page, where it says 0.1 liter sample of an aqueous solution contains 0.1 moles of knackle and 0.10 moles of cockle. What is the minimum number of moles of AgNO3 that must be added to the solution in order to precipitate all Cl minus as AgCl? So this is a classic type of stoichiometry problem right here, where if you follow the steps of stoichiometry, you can be quite successful. Step number one is to write the balanced chemical equation. And the balanced chemical equation has to involve the goal that we're looking for, and that's AgCl solid, because that's what it says we're going to precipitate. And to precipitate it, we need to take all of the silver. The silver comes from the silver nitrate solution. And we want to use up all of the chloride ion that comes from NaCl and CaCl2. And so this ionic type equation right here is the one where we're going to use the mole to mole ratio eventually. And writing this equation is probably the hardest part of this problem. So step number two is to find the number of moles then of Ag and of Cl minus. And they give you some information in the problem to help find the moles of both of these. First of all, what they tell you is that there is a source of chloride ion from NaCl, and there's a source of chloride ion from CaCl2. Both are sources of chloride ion. Both have one mole of these substances. And notice how I kind of highlighted the Cl minuses that are inside of each one of them. And so the total moles of chloride ion would be 0.1 from the NaCl and 0.1 times 2 from the CaCl2. Notice how it's a 2 down here. And so when this dissociates or breaks up, you're going to get 2 Cl minuses. So you're going to have 2 times 0.1 moles of Cl minus. Add those together. 0.1 plus 0.2 gives you 0.3 moles of Cl minus is going to be needed to be precipitated by the Ag. So now that we've got the number of moles, now we can do the mole to mole ratio right here to find the moles of Ag plus. So I have moles of Cl minus 0.3. I want the mole to mole ratio between chloride and silver. Chloride and silver have a one to one ratio in the balanced chemical equation. And so 0.3 moles of Ag plus are the amount that I need. And since there's one Ag in AgNO3, I would need 0.3 moles of AgNO3, which is letter C. Next problem, number 28. Rutherford's gold foil experiment in which gold atoms were bombarded with alpha particles. So this is on page 47 of this edition of the textbook. They have a really nice picture of the gold foil experiment. And in the gold foil experiment, a source of alpha particles was beamed at a sheet of gold foil. Gold foil is like aluminum foil, but it's made out of gold. And an alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons. Two protons would be the element helium, and so sometimes they call this a helium nucleus because it's got two protons and two neutrons. The nucleus of a helium atom is also known as an alpha particle. Well, they took these alpha particles and they beamed them at the gold foil. And when alpha particles pass through gold foil, most of them pass through undeflected and are just detected straight behind it. But when this happened, a few of them were scattered, a few of them at very large angles. Originally, when they did this experiment, they had a model called the plum pudding model of the atom. The plum pudding model said that there were negative and positive charge spaced throughout the atom. This showed that there was a dense positive area to the gold atoms because the positively charged nucleus or the positively charged particles 
of the alpha particle were bounced away from the nucleus of those gold atoms. You can see that most of them passed right through or were just slightly deflected, but some of them bounced straight back because they hit the dense positive nucleus of those gold atoms. The answer would be E because the positive charge of an atom is concentrated in a small region called the nucleus and this was the first experiment that showed that atoms had dense positively charged center called nuclei. The next one is number 31. What's the final concentration of chloride ions when 0.2 CaCl2 is mixed with 0.4 KCl? Notice it's 250 milliliters of each, and you assume that the volumes are additive. So step number one in this is to use the molarity triangle and find the moles of Cl- in CaCl2 and in KCl. We find both of those moles, and then we can take those moles and divide it by our total number of liters after we mix them, and we'll then find the molarity of the solution. So to find the number of moles, moles are equal to molarity times liters. They give us the molarity is 0.2 molar, and the liters is 0.25, 250 milliliters. And so we get 0 0.05 in CaCl2. And in KCl, it's 0.4, and it's 0.25 uh, liters. Multiply those together, and we get 0.1. Now we have to add those together. We have to add those together. And there's a trick to this one. There's a trick to this one because we have CaCl2. And when you multiply these together, notice there are two of these chloride ions. So I would need to multiply this by two. And when I do this, I'd get point whoops, multiply this by, I mean to make a multiply sign here, by 2. And so I wouldn't get 0.15. I'd actually get a total of 0.1 times 0.1, or 0.2 moles of Cl minus total inside of this, because I get double the amount from right here than just the 0.5 when I do the molarity times the liters. Taking those together, then, I would take my point. 2 moles of Cl minus, and I would divide it by my total number of liters of solution. And 0.2 divided by 0.5 equals 0.4. And so 0.4 would be my answer right here, D as in dirigible. And I need to make sure that it says 0.4 right here, 0.4 molar of Cl minus in the solution, which would be D as in dirigible for number 31, D. Next problem, number 32. This one says, what volume of water should be added to 0.4 liters of 6 molar H2SO4 to produce a solution that is 2 molar in H2SO4? Notice my concentration goes down. There, since I'm adding water to it, I know that this is also known as a dilution problem. I'm diluting this with water. I'm taking a concentration and I'm making it less by adding water to the solution. When I do this, the moles of the solute don't change. The moles of H2SO4 that were there before I added the water are equal to the moles of H2SO4 after I add the water. I'm only adding water to this, so the moles of the dissolved substance don't change. Looking at the molarity triangle, if I solve for moles, it equals molarity times liters. And so I can substitute molarity times liters here and molarity times liters here. And so I get molarity times volume before, or I call it 1 and 1, is equal to molarity times volume afterwards. Now I can input my data. The molarity before is 6 molar. The volume before is 0.4 liters. The molarity afterwards is 2 molar. And the final total volume would be V2. 
Doing this math, 6 divided by 2 is 3 times 0.4 would be 1.2 liters total volume at the end. Now the tricky part. It says what volume of water should be added. So this is my total volume, but what I want to know is how much water did I have to add to the 0.4 liters to make it get to here. So 1.2 minus the 0.4 that I started with means that I add 0.8 liters to this, which is letter B is in baboon. The next one is number 33. Number 33 says, which represents the standard formation of BASO4 at 298? So standard simply means that it's standard conditions. Standard conditions are 25 degrees Celsius for thermodynamics, one atmosphere, and one molar solution. And formation means it's formed from its elements at those conditions. And so I want to write an equation that allows me to make BaSO4 solid, because it's a solid at 25 degrees Celsius, form from barium, from sulfur, and from oxygen. And I want to make sure that the equation is balanced. So barium in its elemental form is barium solid. Sulfur in its elemental form is sulfur solid. Oxygen is in its elemental form as O2. It's diatomic, and it's a gas at 25 degrees Celsius. And it's going to make BaSO4. So notice it's diatomic right here. Don't miss that part. And then, like I said, it has to be balanced as well. And so make sure that you put a 2 in front of here, because there needs to be four oxygens to match up with the four oxygens here, which turns out to be C in number 33. Next one is number 34, a challenge problem. In number 34, it asks us to find the standard enthalpy of formation for methane. And what you need to know for this is how to use enthalpies of formation to find enthalpies of reaction. So the enthalpies of formation right here and right here could be subtracted from one another and find the difference in order to find the enthalpy of the reaction. But in this problem, it's challenging because they give you the enthalpy of the reaction and they want you to find one of the enthalpies of formation. In this case, they want you to find a reactance's enthalpy of formation, CH4. So let's go through the math. Don't forget to multiply the co by the coefficient in each one of these. The math would first be, here's my enthalpy of reaction, negative 889. One of the products is CO2, which is negative 393. The other product is H2O, which is negative 286. And notice I multiplied it by 2 because there's a 2 in front of it in the balanced chemical reaction. And then I subtract from it the enthalpy of the reactants. And the reactant that I want to know is CH4. So that's my unknown. And then I have to add it to 2 times oxygen. But oxygen is in its elemental state. And remember, any element in its standard state has an enthalpy of formation of 0. And so it's 2 times 0. So now once I have these, this came from carbon dioxide. This came from water. This is oxygens. This is my unknown. Call it x and find me. And then I can find the equation that matches up to this. So I'll call this one on my unknown x. And doing a little bit of algebra right here and being really careful with my signs, I'll add x to both sides. And I will add, negative, I'm add positive 889 to both sides. And so I end up with 889 on the right-hand side minus this 393 minus this 2 times 286. Notice how there's a minus sign right there. And if you look through, you can find that equation in E in just a little bit different format. Last one, number 35, is a lab question. This one says, which of the following represents an acceptable laboratory practice? 
So first of all, you can't put any hot object on a pan of a balance or you might wreck the balance. Also, you might not get the actual mass because as hot things cool to room temperature, something might evaporate and then you don't know what the actual mass is. But probably most importantly, it is dangerous for the balance. Number two, using distilled water for the final rinse of the burette. Nope, you can't do that because then you'll have drops of distilled water inside the burette. Then you pour in your known solution and you're diluting the solution with the drops of distilled water that are in there. Adding a weighed quality of solid acid to a titration flask wet with distilled water. This is okay. This is okay because the water that's inside the flask will not have any effect on the moles of the solid acid. And when you're doing a titration, what you're concerned about is the moles of acid and the moles of base, or moles of one like substance and moles of another unlike substance, like an oxidizing agent and a reducing agent, like an acid and a base. And so this is okay because the water in there, the H2O, doesn't affect the moles of the acid. Number D, use 10 milliliters of phenolphthalein for a titration of 25 milliliters of acid solution. That's too much. All you need is a few drops. You don't need 10 milliliters with it, and so it's a waste of phenolphthalein solution. An indicator solution, you never need that much of it. A few drops usually is all that's needed. And then in letter E, diluting a solution in a volumetric flask to its final concentration with hot water. Nope, you can't do this. So you never want to use water that's super hot because it'll have a different density than cold. And therefore, when it returns to room temperature or whatever the temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, whatever it approximately is, the water actually has a different density. And therefore, the volume that it occupies might change just a tiny bit. And since you're using a very uh, intricate piece of uh, glassware called a volumetric flask, you want to be as accurate as possible with it, and that shrinkage might cause your concentration to be different. So C is the best answer.